All right, well, welcome everyone uh, to this meeting of Carpinteria Bird Watchers. This is our meeting for whatever today's date is, August 27th, I believe. And today's topic is gulls. We're going to do gulls, or part one of gulls. We'll do gulls now, and then we'll do gulls again in two weeks. And then I promise Brody, we will do birds of prey. So it's coming. I want to get all these done and out of the way so we're all good for our fall, our fall gull watching and hawk watching. Uh, and I'm looking forward to all of these meetings. These should be a lot of fun. So um, let's see. I'm not. I'm going to skip the usual Zoom stuff. You're all Zoom experts at this point. Uh, same co-hosts as usual. Laurel Luby and Tom Bland and Jenny Slaughter are all here. And thank you very much to them. Uh, if you have questions or comments, definitely unmute and and just talk. Yeah. I mean, if you wave your hand at the screen, it's great if I see it, uh, but I may not see it. So. You know, feel free to just unmute and say, uh, excuse me, and we'll, we'll let you in and make it a more interactive meeting. Uh, but I do appreciate everybody's being very good about keeping themselves quiet and muted so I don't get distracted by the sound of, of background noise. Uh, one little bit of uh, just sort of follow up. Um, in previous meetings, I've talked about this issue. Uh, I've, I've sort of become interested in the, the Bird Names for Birds uh, initiative, which is a thing that people on Twitter, in bird Twitter, have engaged in, sort of calling into question the, the naming of birds after people and advocating for changes to those bird names. Um, I don't want to talk about it a lot because I'd rather talk about gulls, uh, but there have been, some, there was sort of an interesting thing, uh, interesting to me. Uh, there was a, a podcast, the American Birding Association podcast, where they did an interview uh, with a historian and um, an ornithologist named Matthew Halley. And he was talking about uh, Audubon, that is John James Audubon, the, the Audubon, the person who, you know, the organization is named after. And talking about some sort of questionable behavior that Audubon engaged in, uh, some sort of scientifically questionable behavior that in, in Halley's view, and I think he has some pretty good evidence for this, uh, was outright fraudulent. And, uh, you know, he, Audubon was a, a great artist, uh, but as Halley puts it, he was also a great con artist. And uh, in that a lot of our North American bird names uh, that are named after people, these, these eponyms, uh, were in fact names bestowed by Audubon. It sort of is interesting if you're like I am sort of following along this little mini drama of trying to change some of those names, anything that calls the, the names into question is sort of intriguing and like, oh yeah, so this was an act of fraud and maybe we shouldn't perpetuate that. So anyway, uh, much more about that is in the links that I put in the uh, blog post for this meeting and in the description for the YouTube live stream for this meeting. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, I encourage you to check it out. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, Anyone have any fun birds to report? Any exciting things you've seen in the last couple of weeks before we, we jump into gulls? Uh, I've been seeing a white-breasted nuthatch a lot. Um, I've been seeing it more than I um, used to. It's been along the trees. It'll be coming to the feeders frequently too, yeah. So are you learning their, their vocalizations? The, the sort of the yeah, it's a that like, they make? Yeah. yeah, I have... Um, there's one that, that likes the sycamore tree in, in our front yard. And, um, you know, on days when I'm, when I'm busy and I want to get my daily eBird list in so I don't break my streak, sometimes I just do 10 minutes in the, in the yard. And uh, I'm always happy if I hear that because it, it you know, bumps my, my yard list up by, by one. Makes me feel like it's a little more respectable. Uh, yeah, and since I've um, uh, been able to since I've learned its call, I've actually been hearing, knowing its call more frequently and been hearing it more frequently too. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. You know, you, you go out there and you, you realize that bird is out there without having to even see it. Uh, yeah, it's one of the great benefits of learning the, the vocalizations. Uh, anyone else have any, anything to share? Anything particularly exciting? We are getting into the exciting bird season. Hi, Mary Jo. Hey. I, uh, not big interest to you guys, I'm sure, but I've had an Anna's hummingbird, uh, a female at the feeder here in Ketchikan, Alaska. Normally it's Rufus all the time, all summer. 
They usually leave the end of July, which they seem to, and suddenly this other different looking hummingbird popped up and I don't see the Anna's up here that much. So it was kind of a kick to see something different. I don't know why she doesn't go south. Uh, it's certainly time to, it's the first of September. Wow. So John, I didn't realize, so you're, you're tuning in from, from Ketchikan? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, we have much more reach than I even imagined. So that, that, that's great to hear. Well, I hope that, you know, our very Southern California specific bird content is at least somewhat interesting for you or somewhat useful for you. Well, David Taylor is a friend of mine and turned me on to this uh, whole deal. And uh, I like going down and visiting with him and uh, seeing all the birds down there. So this has really been fun and interesting, yeah. Cool, well, you'll be, you'll be well prepared with, with lots of Southern California bird information. There you go, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, anyone else, Any anything particularly fun? Yeah, Mary Jo, what do you have? Um, two weekends ago at, at the um, Carpinteria Creek Estuary, I saw a lone um, Canada goose. Did anyone see that? It was there for the two two days by itself. You know, wow. that was just odd, and it was absolutely uh, you know. There's no they looked exactly like in the book, and you know, and it was there, and it was with the mallards for a little while. You know, and it was all by itself. I thought that was really bizarre. It was two weekends ago on Sunday, uh, Saturday and Sunday. I saw it both days. That's really cool. I had um, okay. I had a list. I'd have to go back and look in eBird. Sometime over the last few weeks, I was walking the beach either around there or down near Rincon Point and had a, a Canada goose fly over, which could have been the same individual. It could be hanging around. But that is really cool. Yeah, our, you know, we're so... Uh, it's, it's hard to find freshwater wetland habitat in, in our part of the coastline here. So any, any little freshwater source, you know, you get really interesting birds, even if it's just a little tiny thing like that, that it's probably brackish water, but that mouth of Carpinteria Creek. Yeah. yeah. It surprised me. <laughs> Canada cool. yeah. without being in a flock, you know, hot. Yeah, yeah, just, you know, I, hanging around. Well, yeah. um, that's exciting. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna mush on, and we'll we'll get going on gulls because gulls are a, a very big topic, and it's uh, you just have to jump in and and grapple with it. Is is my my philosophy of gulls. So let me go ahead and uh, let's see if I can figure this out. I'm going to share my screen. Oh, actually, I see we have some comments in the chat. Let me look at that. Uh, so uh, Courtney mentioned yesterday, we saw a strikingly all white scrub jay with bright blue wings. Wow, that is really cool. Courtney, where did, where did you guys see where that? Did you guys see that? Yeah, I neglected to put that. That was right on the edge of uh, Greenwall Preserve. I, as soon as we were just pulling in to go birding and uh, he just caught our eye even before we got out of the vehicle and he was pure white, except for his wings were bright blue. It was really striking. Wow, that would be amazing to see. Uh, yeah. I may go birding there and see if I can find it because that sounds like a lot of fun. And then uh, Lucia says, new to bird watchers culture, always one of the names of birds, love to be around nature, a lot to learn, work in Carpinteria. Uh, well, this is great. Yeah, no, it's great to have you here, Lucia. Is it Lucia, am I pronouncing it right? Lucia. Lucia, there, oh, that makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> right, well, thank you, thank you for joining us. It's great to see people here who are, who are new to the group. Um, Okay, have I overlooked anything before we go on? Last last chance to grab the steering wheel and drive us in a different direction. Yes, Brody, I see you have your hand up. Um, I was just gonna say, um, along with the Anna's hummingbird setting, I have been seeing a black chin hummingbird around my house. Yeah. Very They're, cool. Um, right on a little um fence of that we have grapevines on. <laughs> they every five minutes they'll come back. At, one day, um, I would um, go out there, take a picture with a little camera that I have, and then come back inside. Five minutes later, I'll come out, get another picture over and over. Yeah. I am, cool. I am yeah, deeply envious of your, your black-chinned hummingbird. I occasionally have had them in our yard, but, but they don't hang around here. Uh, so I haven't been seeing them in a while. So that is really neat. Um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can start talking about gulls. 
Uh, let's see. Okay, if I've done this correctly, you should be seeing a gull. And I see some thumbs up, thank you, yes. So um, let's talk about gulls. Well, they are very cool. Uh, this gull is not a gull we're, we're going to see in Carpinteria. Well, we could, but very unlikely. This is a Ross's gull, and I just threw it in here because I think they're really neat looking. They live up in the high Arctic, and uh, occasionally they get down to the lower 48. Uh, one does, but I've never seen one, but I just like them, so I put that in there. But here's a gull we're more familiar with around here. And uh, let's talk in general about gulls. So gulls are a bunch of things. They are widespread. So that you find them all across North America, in fact, all over the world. Uh, they're not so much, uh, I mean, people call them seagulls, but they're not really, most species at least, are not really pelagic birds. They're not really out at sea. There's a few species that are, but most of them are more birds of the shoreline uh, or birds of inland wetlands. They're actually pretty diverse in terms of the habitats that they can, they can inhabit. Um, and they're very successful. So where a lot of birds uh, have declined as a result of human changes to the landscape over the last hundred years or so, gulls have actually done quite well. Uh, you know, a lot of what humans do, uh, gulls see as an opportunity and they move in and, and take advantage. So, you know, uh, open air dumps are notoriously great places to go see gulls if you don't mind walking around a dump. Uh, because you'll see hundreds and hundreds of gulls there. Um, they, they take advantage of whatever's available. Uh, and they're easy to observe. So that's a cool thing about gulls. You know, you, you don't have to like crane your neck into the, the top of a tree for an hour to get a brief glimpse of it. They're, they're right out there where you can see them. Uh, but they are sometimes hard to identify. Gulls are, are sort of notoriously a, a tricky group to really get, you know, thoroughly under your belt as a, a bird watcher learning to identify gulls. And this takes me to my, my favorite gull quote that, I mean, I've done this, a version of this talk a few times now. So some of you have been in the group for a while. I've seen this, but I'm gonna make you go through it again. Uh, this is David Sibley's advice about gulls from the, the Sibley Field Guide. Gull identification represents one of the most challenging and subjective puzzles in birding and should be approached only with patient and methodical study, a casual or impatient approach will not be rewarded. So this is, I think, very good advice. I mean, Sibley usually has very good advice, uh, but in this case, I think it's especially apt. Um, when I get into trouble with gulls, it is often because uh, in hindsight, I tried to take a shortcut. You know, there's, there's some feature about the bird that, that leads me in a certain direction and I jump to an ID without taking the time to really look at the whole picture and, and taking in all the available evidence. So it's, it's very good to hold off on your theorizing until you have gathered all the relevant facts. So why are gulls hard? So if you're like me, I, I like to analyze things. I work as a programmer and I functional decomposition is a thing that I do. I wanna break the problem down into little pieces. And, and so I think through, you know, why are gulls hard? Why is this a difficult group? Uh, well, there's a lot of variation, right? So the, you know, the sort of standard beginner approach to identifying birds is you've got the field guide, it has the picture, you've got the bird, you find the picture in the field guide that matches the bird you're looking at, and you're done, right? Success. Uh, with gulls, it's, it's problematic because the, the adult form, you know, they eventually look like that, and they will look like that for many years. Gulls live like 20 or 30 years. So in any you know, big group of gulls you see, a lot of them are going to be adults because they, they hang around for a long time. Um, but that's only one plumage, that's only one appearance. And actually gulls go through, you know, four or five distinct different appearances as they, as they mature. And um, it can be very confusing. There's a lot of different things to keep track of. We're gonna talk about four species of gulls, the big four I'm calling them, uh, which down here in Santa Barbara County are the four most commonly seen. And, uh, you know, it's not just four birds to learn. It's, you know, four times four or five. So you got like 16 or 20 different plumages that those birds have. So that's a lot to, to figure out just for those four species. So that's one of the things that makes gulls hard to figure out. There's a lot of variety. Um, and then there's not just age related, but also weathering and molt related variation. They don't just 
you know, goes right from one plumage bing into the next plumage, right? There's a gradual process where their feathers age and the feathers get faded, the black feathers become brownish and frayed, the dark feathers become lighter, and then, you know, they get to the point where they need to replace the feathers and then the new feathers come in, but they come in over a period of months, you know, a few feathers at a time. So you get a lot more variety. It's not just those four or five different variations. There's all these intermediate steps in between. So a lot more variation because of that. And then there's individual variation. So within the same species, two gulls of the same age can be at completely different stages. Uh, or, you know, some can uh, be relatively light or relatively dark. There's a, there's a wide range of individual variation. And to learn these different plumages and to learn to identify these gulls, you really need to look at a lot of gulls <laughs> to get a sense of what is the range of individual variation. You know, uh, how big does the beak need to be before I'm no longer thinking it's this one gull, but it's this other gull with a bigger beak. And you know, it can be it can be tricky. And finally, if all this wasn't hard enough, there is hybridization. So uh, some species of gulls really call into question our sort of uh, our, our attempt to make a neat little box and put different birds into different species boxes. Uh, so one bird in particular, the western gull, the most common gull we have on our beaches here. Uh, and in a little bit, we'll look at its range map and its breeding range goes up to like around Puget Sound and the Olympic Peninsula up in Washington. And at that point, if you continue north, there's a very similar gull, a closely re related gull, the glaucous winged gull. We also get down here sometimes, uh, but it starts to take its place. And in that zone of overlap, they actually interbreed a lot. They just you know, they commonly have one bird that looks like a glaucous winged and one that looks like a western gull in a pair and they're producing hybrid offspring. And in fact, in the Olympic Peninsula area, there's a term for these, these Olympic gulls and they're, they're hybrids. They're sort of intermediate and they have some of the characteristics of the glaucous winged and some of the characteristics of the western gull. And they outnumber the, the you know, pure quote unquote western and glaucous winged gulls in that area. And occasionally some of those hybrids find their way down our way. And that's just one example. There's other gull species where their their breeding ranges of these two, you know, we call them separate species, but they overlap and they hybridize a fair amount. So that can make things even more confusing. So it's a lot of there's a lot to keep track of. There's a lot of variety there. Okay, but let's talk about the the good side. It's not all doom and gloom. Why are gulls easy? Uh, the gulls are are trying to work with us, and it's up to us to take advantage of that. Um, so as I mentioned before, they're used to people. They like to hang out in areas where people are and they put up with us a fair amount. You know, they'll, in fact, you know, we've probably all had the experience if you go to the beach where you walk away from your sandwich or whatever and you come back and the gull has moved right in, you know, during the 30 seconds you were away. So, uh, you know, they will leave if you approach them too closely, but they'll let you get pretty darn close and they'll hang out there and let you get really good looks at them. So you can study them, you know, the, the, ID challenges are tricky, but not because you can't get a good look. You know, usually you can get a really good look at a gull if you're trying to figure out what it is. So that's helpful. Um, and this is huge. So they tend to form these big mixed flocks. So you'll see a you know, big group of gulls with different species mixed together and different plumage states mixed together. You'll have the immature gulls and you'll have the adult gulls. And this is great. This is really super helpful. Um, you know, I didn't talk about, I'm going to, I guess I'll talk, talk briefly about um, resources for, for, you know, checking for, for identifying your goals. You want to have your, your field guide, you want to study your field guide. Um, so there's the, the small Sibley, I'm a big fan of Sibley, obviously. So this is the Western Sibley, or this is the previous edition of the Western Sibley, but it's, it's a good, great field guide, you know. Um, it, it is fairly good, I mean, it's really good on goals, but in, in this case, I think the the, the big Sibley, the, uh, the, the full North American Sibley is, is worth investing in uh, because it has more photos of these uh, gull variations. It just has, you know, it has more room and he put more illustrations of these different uh, stages of these different birds in there. So uh, this is an excellent, excellent gull resource and there's others. Um, but then as you wanna get into more specialized uh, gull, uh, resources. This book is fabulous. This is a the Peterson Reference Guide to Gulls of the Americas. Unfortunately, it's not in print these days, so uh, you need to be somewhat resourceful to come up with one. But it has just 
uh, page after page of, of photos of these different gulls and all their different plumage states. And uh, it's just uh, really, really super helpful. If you, when you, I mean, this one almost does let you do that thing where it's, okay, you've got the gull and you want to find a, you know, a picture that matches it. Your, your Gulls of America is probably going to be one of your best bets to, to find a field guide that has a picture of the gull. That's not obviously a field guide. This is going to be a lot to carry around. But if you take a photo, then you can compare it back at your desk. Um, and finally, this book came out just a year or two ago, uh, Gulls Simplified by uh, Pete Dunn and Kevin Carlson. Um, excellent book, uh, a little more manageable, although still probably not something you want to take out in the field. Uh, but again, a lot of great photos of gulls in different stages and, and discussion of how to identify them. And I thought of those books right now because uh, Dunn and Carlson and Gulls Simplified, they're very big on this, uh, this, this last bullet point that they form these mixed flocks that let, give you easy comparisons. You know, they say, look, you've got a yardstick there. If you can identify any of those gulls, and usually you can identify some of them, you know, it'll be relatively easy. You now have a, you know, a, an exact measurement for the gull that you're confused about. You know, it's a little bit smaller than that one, or it's a little bit bigger than that one, and that can be really, really helpful. Finally, and one more thing that is really uh, helpful in terms of figuring out your gulls is that the rarities are rare, right? So the vast majority of the gulls you see when you go out bird watching here in Carpinteria, go down to the beach, um, are going to be the expected species. And, you know, in the, the summer or early fall, there's really only four of them you're likely to see. And those are the big four we're going to talk about tonight. As you get more into the fall and the winter, there's, you know, another five or six that you conceivably could see. But even that is, is pretty manageable. Very occasionally, there's a few others that, that might show up, but that's great. If you've learned the, the standard ones, those other ones will really stand out. But you don't have to stress over it if you're just trying to figure out, you know, what's in this gull flock. Almost all of them are going to be the ones you expect to be there. So that can help make your life a little simpler. OK, so what is the process like? When you're looking at gulls, you know, I keep talking about oh, matching it to the picture in the field guide, but really that's that's not the way to go. The, the way to go is to have, in my view, a, a sort of hierarchy of characteristics that you work your way through. And it's important to understand which of these are more important and because you're going to have conflict. You're going to have, you know, oh, characteristic A says this is one species, characteristic B says it's another. And you want to have a way of kind of balancing those and figuring out what's, what's the, the, the true information that's going to guide you there. So the first thing I think you should always look at or always be thinking about is overall size and shape. So here's two adult gulls. Um, these are among the big four. These are two of the big four. We're going to be seeing a lot of these in the photos we look at later in this meeting. Um, and they're different photos. Uh, unfortunately, they're kind of in different light. So the bird on the right looks almost bluish, but really it's not so much. It's, it's more just a lighter shade of gray. That's just lighting characteristics when I took the photo. But I tried to size them relative to each other so their sizes are, are roughly correct there. So if they were standing next to each other, this is what their relative size and shape would look like. Um, and yeah, and here just disregard colors and field marks. Uh, just look at the silhouette. You're just looking at the shape of the bird. And that's super helpful because with all that plumage variety that we talked about, all those dozens of variations of what the bird could look like, they're all going to look about the same size and shape. You know, there's some variety there. Male gulls tend to be a little bigger. Female gulls tend to be a little smaller. Um, but for the most part, even juvenile gulls that are only a few months old are full size. They, they look the same size as their parents, and they have the same basic proportions. So at first glance, you know, these two birds are both gull-shaped. I mean, they look very similar. Like, what's, what's the, you know, I don't see a big difference there. But as you start to think about it, you know, uh, this one on the left is relatively compact. It's, it's primary feathers here, the, the folded black wingtips don't extend that far past the end of the tail. Right? There's not too much primary extension here. Whereas on this bird, there's significantly more primary extension, right? And proportionally, this bird is, is just longer and, and kind of narrower. And if you think about sort of drawing that oval around each of them, um, you can see those are slightly differently shaped ovals. And it's, it's subtle, but if you start really paying attention to it, it's, it's obvious. Like if you were at the supermarket checking your eggs to make sure they weren't cracked when you put them in the cart, 
you know, you would notice an egg that was this shape as opposed to an egg that was this shape, right? That's a difference you can learn to recognize and key into. So look for those overall size and shapes when you're looking at your gull flock. Um, so then we move on to the next category, uh, which is the bear parts. And again, I'm still, I'm saying, don't look at the plumage yet. Don't worry about the colors on the bird, on the bird's feathers yet. We'll get to that. But it's not as important as these things because the plumage lies. I mean, the plumage is so variable, uh, but the bear parts will, will tell you a truer story. So, and here we're talking about the beak is probably the most important feature on a gull if you're trying to figure out what it is. Look at the shape of the beak. How long is it? How thick is it? Uh, gulls usually have a little bit of a swelling here on the lower part of the beak. This is called the gonus, and this is like a gonidial uh, spur, a gonidial spot kind of here. Um, and different gulls have different sizes of that little, that little projection there. So pay attention to that, look for that. Um, and again, the overall length of the beak, how thick it is top to bottom. You know, we talk about a heavy beak or a lighter beak, meaning like thicker or thinner. That's, and any markings on the beak are also very helpful. Okay, so this one, it's got this orange beak with a black tip. This one's got a yellow beak with a black ring around it. That's important. Okay, and also eyes. Eyes are really important with gulls. Look at the eye color, the iris color. So this bird on the left has a very light iris and almost white. This bird on the right has a very dark iris. That will, that will help you in terms of identifying them. And the legs, the color of the legs. Um, and it's not like you can just look at that. Like there's variety, you know, in the leg color, even within the same species, but it's a really important clue. It'll really help you. Okay, so now you can look at plumage. This is the third of three things that I'm telling you you should, you should focus on. And you'd need to get all the way through this list. You need to look at all these things, but I'm just giving you a sense of importance, relative importance. So here are four adult gulls. These are in fact the big four species we're gonna be talking about that we have on the beach here in Carpinteria right now. And um, now I've kind of resized them. So they're all the same size. So I'm not really emphasizing the differences in size because these are not all identically sized. But I'm just talking now about the colors. And again, it's unfortunate that this photo has different lighting so it looks more bluish, but really it's, it should be a gray that's kind of intermediate between this gray and this gray. And the specific shade of the gray of the, the so-called mantle feathers on the bird's back in an adult gull, it's really important, a very important clue. Like this is a relatively dark gray. This is a relatively light gray. And those differences again are subtle, but if you learn to really focus on them, uh, they will help you out a lot. Okay, so that's what you're gonna look at. Um, one more little bit of background, one more little bit of detail before we start looking at, at photos of, of gulls uh, specifically to the look at the different species. And that's wing geography. So you kind of need to have a sense of what feathers are where or what they're called so you can you know, understand what you're reading in the field guide. Um, so the flight feathers, these are the, the big long feathers that come off the back of the wing that, that provide most of that airfoil for the bird in flight. These ones out here in the outer part of the wing are called the primaries and gulls have 10 of them. Uh, so these are the, the, the big long feathers for flying. The secondaries is this next batch of 10 or so that are, that are inside there. And then there's actually some, another group here called the tertials, but I'm not gonna bother labeling them because I have too many labels, but primaries and secondaries. So kind of that's what you're talking about. When you're talking about those feathers, you're talking about this part of the bird's wing. And then there are coverts. So the base of the primaries and secondaries are protected and, and by these coverts that cover the, the underlying feather and they kind of smooth over that airfoil. So it gives it a really nice aerodynamic shape. And this, this first row you, you see as you move forward on the wing, these are the greater coverts. And there's a row of median coverts. And finally, there's several rows of, of little teeny lesser coverts. All right, we all good on that? It's a lot of terminology. I apologize for the terminology. Um, okay, so this photo uh, is meant to kind of show you where all those feather groups go when the bird folds up its wing. Because a lot of the time you're looking at these gulls, you're going to be looking at a bird that has its wing all folded up. And what you can see in this, this California gull that's folding its wing is the, the primaries are here. So they kind of hinge inward 
right? If it were to spread its wings out, the primaries would come out this way, but it folds them in. So this is the upper surface of the wing, the upper surface of the primaries now folded under. And here are, well, actually I have them labeled. <laughs> so here we go. So there's the primaries. Here's the secondaries. So the inner part of the trailing edge of the wing when the bird was in flight, that's in this part of the folded wing. And then here's the greater coverts and the median coverts and the lesser coverts. And when it's all folded up, it's just gonna look like this bird up here, right? Where the primaries are sticking out, but really all you're really seeing there is the coverts, right? The secondaries are kind of tucked up inside, right? And the coverts are there to sort of protect the wing. Like it's very important to a gull that its wing be protected. You know, they don't want those feathers to wear out any sooner than they have to. They need them to survive. So they protect them when they're walking around. Okay, uh, I think that's it in terms of background. Now we move on to the actual species. So um, actually before I do that, uh, so any, any questions? You've all been super quiet and I don't know if that's because you're falling asleep or because you're just you know, writing everything down and you're very focused. So uh, anything that you know, jumps out at you? Any, anything was unclear? Again, any questions? No, I'm seeing head shakes. I can only see so many. I can only see about six of you when I'm in this mode where I'm sharing the screen. So I apologize if, if somebody's out there frantically waving their hands. Um, I can't see. So you know, unmute and, and let me know if you fall into that category and, and we'll you know, gladly discuss whatever it is that needs discussing. Okay, but let's move on. So here are the uh, gulls of Santa Barbara County uh, for each week in the year. And we look at these in every meeting pretty much, but this is a histogram and the thickness of the green box shows the percentage of eBird checklists that include that species in Santa Barbara County for the given week in the year. So if you look across, you can see uh, how these species become more and less common over the course of the year. So there are a lot of gulls that you can see in Santa Barbara County, uh, but really, you know, most of the time you're gonna see these four. Right? You're gonna see them throughout the year and they're by far the most common ones you're gonna see out there. So we've got uh, the thickest green bar here, the most common species is the Western gull. And then the next thickest is probably the California gull. It gets a little thin here in the breeding season. And we'll see why that is when we look at its range map in a second. They're not really breeding around here. Some of them hang around here anyway. So that's why the, the line continues. But then in the winter, we get a bunch more. You know? And then, um, kind of a, a similar pattern with the ring-billed gull and even thinner during the breeding season. And it's sort of the same thing. They're, they're breeding throughout North America. And then in the winter, they go to the coast because it's a much better place to hang out than you know Nebraska in the middle of winter. Um, nothing against Nebraska, but you know if you're a gull, you don't want ice and snow. You want a, a nice coastline. Um, and then Hearman's gull, again, kind of a similar pattern. They don't really breed around here. They do breed kind of earlier in the year. They have a really interesting, well, we'll talk about it when we get to it. And then the rest of the year they're here. So, and those are the four species we're gonna talk about today. We won't talk about any of these other species anymore today. Although two weeks from now, we'll cover five more of them and then you'll be all set to go. Okay, so let's look at the big four. I don't know why I have such a, I just like saying that. It sounds like we're doing something very important and significant, like we're, you know, going into battle or something, I don't know. We'll start with this bird. Uh, so this is a bird, the most common species. We just looked at it on the, the histogram. This is the Western gull. And this is a big gull. This is the biggest one we commonly have around here. Uh, it's the darkest mantle. So the, the mantle is technically this little part of the back, but when we talk about the mantle shade of a gull, we're really talking about the, the mantle and the coverts, you know, that sort of big gray patch. Western gull has a relatively dark mantle. Um, uh, what else has it got? It's, it's bare parts. Its beak is really heavy. That is, it's a very thick beak. And there's some variation. This one is a particularly heavy beaked individual, but they all, and they tend to have a pretty big gonidial swelling. This, this beak actually gets, you know, noticeably thicker towards the end, which is a, a good characteristic that you might be looking at a Western gull. And as all those weird plumage variations change, that beak will be a constant that you can look for. Um, very pink legs in the adult bird, and actually in a lot of the other plumages as well. It's a relatively pink-legged gull. Um, and let's see, what else can we say about it? I don't know. Let's go look at pictures. 
Uh, okay, so what I've done is uh, I want you to to know how to use eBird. Yeah, Brody, I see you have your hand up. Did you have a question? Yes. Um, also, it's co um co um it's uh, primaries are um short. It's that is true. Yeah, short. yeah. It's it's relatively compact, right? It's not a really yeah. stretched out gull with long primary extension. It's it's more of more of a compact. What color are the eyes? Ah, good question. So the eyes are sort of an olive color in the adult. There's some variety. They're, they're, they're not super light colored, uh, like, like say the ring-billed gull that we'll look at later, uh, but they're not super dark either. You know, they're, they're sort of in the middle with some individual variation. Um, okay, I'm going to possibly mess up my screen share by going to a different window. So do you guys see the All About Birds page? Yeah, thumbs up, excellent. That's great, that worked. I'm happy about that. Um, okay, so uh, this is a page you can get to from eBird. It's, this is All About Birds is a sort of an online field guide that um, uh, Cornell Lab puts out, the same people who, who create eBird. And it's got lots of great photos and it's you know really fabulous. Uh, I use it all the time. So I'm just gonna click here on the, the range map to kind of show you the, the Western gulls range. So here, uh, this is the purple breeding area from down here about halfway down Baja California up to close to the Olympic Peninsula. We're right here. So, you know, it's, it's breeding around here. They're breeding on the offshore islands. They breed on Anacapa Island. Um, and then in the, the non-breeding season, the winter months, they spread a little further. So they go a little further north and, and a little further south as well. But we have them year round. Um, let's see, ID info. I wanna look at these photos because these are really helpful. So the way my brain works, I wanna start with the juvenile and move forward. And they kind of start with the adult and move back. So I'm gonna skip ahead here to the juvenile. So here is a juvenile Western gull. So this is a relatively young gull, right? This gull is just, you know, a month or two old. Uh, we definitely see them in this form around here a lot. You know, they, they breed out there on the islands and they're hanging out on our beaches, stealing our sandwiches, you know, just, just a few weeks later. Um, it's relatively dark. Uh, and, but again, you can see it already has that, that relatively heavy bill, that thick bill with the gonidial swelling being pretty pronounced. Uh, the bill is all dark in the juvenile, and it's going to become lighter at the base as it ages, which is sort of a common gull thing to do. Um, the legs are kind of like got a you know pinkish kind of cast to them in this individual. Um, they will get you know more bright pink as it ages, but these are all good things to pay attention to. Um, but I'm going to move pretty quick, so we're just going to keep on going. So as the the young gull ages. Here's the first winter look. And this is basically that same plumage, but now it's aged. It's, it's the feathers have, have bleached within the sun with time and they've gotten frayed around the edges. You can kind of tell these are older feathers. These coverts here are relatively old and, and kind of icky looking. They're, they're all scraggly looking. Um, and it's become whiter. Like it's starting to molt in these, these more adult shade feathers here. And then something that's really useful to look for in the Western gull is this thing called a skirt. So what you're looking at down here, th this is the edge of the greater coverts, th this kind of mottled brown feathers here. And then this sticking out, these are the secondaries. These are the trailing edge of the flight feathers on the base of the wing. And because Western gulls have a relatively uh, broad wing, the wing is relatively large front to back, it's not a long, narrow wing, it's a, it's a broader wing. They don't always have room to tuck the whole wing up under the coverts. So you see this skirt, they call it. It's like a little skirt hanging out, like a petticoat hanging out of your skirt if your skirt is too short. Um, anyway, uh, it's a Western gull thing. So look for that skirt. You won't always see it, but if you do see it, it's a good sign that you're, you're talking about a Western gull. Okay, so as it ages, here we have another first winter bird that's a little further along. And again, you can see that skirt there. It's, it's the, these dark feathers. Those are the secondary feathers, the, the, the trailing edge of the wing um, peeking out from under the, the coverts. And also this one's starting to get some adult 
type mantle feathers molting in. See, there's like this dark gray showing up here. Those are new mantle feathers. And you don't need the whole mantle to fill in in order to take advantage of that clue. Like even in a bird that's you know just a year old, they will start to get these, these adult shade mantle feathers coming in. And you can see how bright, how light or dark they are. And it's very helpful. Because again, a lot of these immature gulls look pretty similar to each other. You know, they they look most distinctive when they're adults, but as they're as they're aging, you know, as they're going through their juvenile and first winter plumages, uh, they, they look quite similar in a lot of cases. You see the beak is starting to get some pink at the base. So this is again a sort of a common pattern. It's got more white going on now on the head. The legs are more light pinkish. Uh, let's follow this bird a little further, or another bird, but same species. So here it is in its second winter. And you know, I used to get very focused on trying to specifically age each of the birds I was looking at to what specific year they were in. Um, and the, the Dunn and Carlson books, Gulls Simplified, kind of broke me of that habit. They're like, yeah, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> there's just, you know, there's the juveniles and there's the adults, and then there's like a couple phases in between, and they kind of mix and match in different ways as they're growing. Some, you know, go one winter or two winters. The large gulls tend to take four years to become uh, their full adult plumage. So that's these Western gulls are four year gulls. Smaller gulls take three years, even smaller little gulls take two years sometimes. So it's not super important, but just kind of recognize the phases. So this one's got more white going on, more pink at the base of the bill, um, more of the adult shade mantle feathers coming in. Uh, you can see it's actually molted in some fresh primaries. So they're not all raggedy looking. Um, some of the coverts are looking pretty raggedy still. You can see the secondaries are sticking out and they're getting kind of worn on the end. These are called the, these are the tertials, these big ones at the back here. Anyway, we're gonna move on. All right, here's a bird that's getting closer still to the adult plumage. So now it's got mostly an adult type pattern going on. Um, just a little bit of these older brown coverts with a lot of the fresh new adult fa shade feathers coming in. And then here we are uh, very close to the adult pattern. The only things that really separate this from an adult bird is it doesn't yet have the little white spots in the tips of the primaries. That's usually like the last thing that a gull gets when it's in full adult you know, plumage. Um, and the smudging around the head and neck, you know, usually that will, in Western gull, it, it won't really have much of that at all by the time it's a full four year adult. And the beak still has a fair amount of dark on it. You know, it won't have that much dark when you get into the adult, the adult gull. But it's pretty close to an adult. Like you have to kind of, and you can't see it, but it, a lot of times birds in this sort of sub adult phase have a little black on the tail as well that the adults will not have. All right, and that's a video. We're going to skip that. So here is a, a non breeding adult. So, like uh, pretty much all gulls, uh, there is a breeding and a non breeding plumage for the adult, and they cycle between them, right? So, in the winter months, they will have their non-breeding appearance. And then in the breeding season, they'll get their summer plumage and they'll, they'll look a little snazzier. Um, here you are with your adult uh, Western gull. It's a little bit of black on the beak. It's got this red gonidial spot. Um, it's got very pink legs, not too much smudging on the head and neck, really dark mantle, little white spots on the tips of the primaries, kind of letting you know like, oh yeah, this is a, this is a full-on adult gull. And then here's a, a Western gull in breeding plumage. So um, very clean white head. Actually gets this little red orbital ring, this little red ring of skin around the eye. It's hard to see in the photo, but if you're really close to a gull in the field, you might see that during the breeding season. Um, beak is, is all yellow with, with no black and that red gonidial spot. Um, very pink legs. That's your sort of classic adult Western gull. Okay. Are we, any questions about the Western gull? You've all got the Western gull now. You've, you've seen it, you understand it. Good to go on Western gull. Okay, um, on we go. So the next species. Wait, wait. Yeah. Western, I noticed that a lot of them had like dark eye around, dark stuff around their eye. Yeah. Is that true or is that just accidental? 
that I know um, that. Well, it's it's true. I mean, they especially as they are maturing, you know, they will have different amounts of sort of smudgy dark markings on their head and neck, and um, yeah, it's. Uh, it's something to look for. There's a lot of individual variety and it kind of depends on how old they are and what phase of their molt they're in. And, you know, it's great when you can go down to the beach and just see, you know, 20 of them all lined up and you can go one to the other, to the other, to the other, and you kind of get a sense, you know, what is the, what's, what's like, you know, what's important and what's kind of just sort of random variation. Um, yeah, they do have smudging and the amount and extent of the smudging is, is significant. We're going to see a bunch of pictures later. I'm going to, I'm going to go through these these four species, kind of take you through their plumages, and then we're just going to look at lots of photos from the beach here. <laughs> just kind of say, okay, here's a bunch of gulls. What do you think we're looking at? So, we'll, and you'll see examples of that. So uh, here we are again with the uh, the California gull, probably our next most common species. This is a, a, a nice adult California gull. Um, so again, it's it's a little more elongated than the western gull. The the wingtips go out a little further, and it's just more on a sort of stretched out horizontal silhouette that it has, you know, rather than that Western gull was more of a chunky kind of, you know, thick, powerful looking body of a gull. Um, let's see, they have a dark eye. So that's, that's a good thing to look for. Um, the adult has this dark eye. The beak is uh, long, relatively long, uh, not super thin, but not as thick as the Western gull's beak. And it has a little bit of a gonidial swelling, but again, not as much as the Western gull has. So you really wanna, you just wanna study those beak shapes. You're gonna look at a lot of, a lot of gull beaks in your, your journey to becoming adept at gull identification. And you just wanna kind of get that California gull beak shape in your head. Uh, this black ring with a little red gonidial spot associated with it, that's sort of classic California gull adult beak look like that. That black ring with a little red spot behind it. That's what most of your adult California gulls are going to show and it, it's a good distinguishing characteristic. If you see that you should be thinking, oh, this is probably a California gull. I better check my other features and make sure they line up with that. What uh, color the leg... do you call that beak? What's that? What's the color of that beak? I'd say it's yellowish. You know, some of them look a little more gray. Kind of depends. I think they, they cycle like breeding plumage, they'll be more yellow and non breeding, maybe a little grayer. Individual, it's, a lot of these kind of bare part colors are, are kind of dependent on diet and health. Like if the gull has been eating really well, it might have, you know, relatively bright colors. Sometimes you'll see a gull that kind of looks really super scraggly, like it hasn't molt, like it's missed a molt, like it just hasn't even been able to molt and it's got really old, messed up looking feathers that are all frayed at the edges. And a lot of times with those birds, you'll see they'll have like really pale, like with, instead of a yellow beak, it'd be a really gray beak. Um, so it's, yeah, it's again, a lot of individual variation and it reflects both their genetics and also just what they've been eating lately and, and how healthy they are. Um, the legs are a little bit, not, not bright pink like the adult Western gull. They're more, you know, more of a greenish kind of cast. Um, so that's an important thing to look for. And the white spots in the adult uh, California gull are relatively large. So these little white spots in the tips of the primaries, they're, they're relatively prominent, relatively big white spots compared to some of the other gull species. And then um, another thing is this, this dark uh, flecking on the, the head, especially uh, it tends to be thickest down here in the base of the neck, the back of the, the neck, um, but it's kind of smudgy. Uh, we'll see an example later that looks more like little spots. Like this looks like it was done with a paintbrush maybe. And then the, the ring-billed gull we're gonna look at later, looks more like it was done with a pencil, you know, little tiny flecks. Um, and in the winter, like I'm not, I don't even recall when this picture was taken, but in the winter plumage, sometimes that, that dark smudging on the head gets fairly extensive in the California gull. And then it gets less of it in the breeding season. Okay, let's go ahead and look and I'm going to go a little faster now because we want to get through this and look at the fun photos. Um, here is its range map. And you can see that unlike the Western gull, which is very much, you know, just a coastal species, the California gull goes way inland. And in fact, you know, it covers a large part of the Western US. Um, there's a statue of California gulls in Salt Lake City, I think, because they famously 
ate the locusts that were threatening the early Mormon settlers' crops. So the gulls were there to save them from that and enjoy a tasty snack of, of grasshoppers. Anyway, a lot of California gulls throughout the, the Great Basin area. They spread out here to breed and then they retreat, as I was saying, to the coast to, uh, for, the, for the winter. Okay, what do I want? I want ID info. And again, I'm gonna skip forward to the, the juvenile bird and we'll work our way back up through the ages. Okay, so here is our juvenile California gull. Um, again, you've already got that, that thinner beak. You know, it's, it's, it's all pretty dark, similar to that, that uh, Western gull juvenile, but not quite as dark a little bit lighter. Um, the beak is thinner with less of a gonidial swelling. Uh, the base of the beak is pink here. That happens fairly quickly as the gull is growing up. You know, for a few weeks it might be all dark, but then it starts to look more like this. Um, you know, this kind of heavily patterned uh, coverts with light edges and dark centers, sort of a California gull look, and it's got the long you know, this bird's kind of puffed up, so it doesn't look quite as dramatic. But, you know, in general, you're going to see like this long uh, wing extension, primary extension. And the fact that they migrate further, like the Western gulls don't migrate very extensively. Uh, in general, it's a rule with birds that the, the more migratory a species is, the longer and, and thinner its wings tend to be. So you see that with shorebirds, you see it with gulls. Uh, the California gull has to migrate further. So its wings are longer and narrower because this is more efficient, I guess, for long range migration. Whereas the Western gull is shorter and broader, which is maybe more efficient for soaring and just kind of gliding around locally, but not so much for covering long distances. Okay, so as the California gull grows up, uh, it's a three-year gull. So it, it matures faster than the Western gulls. And in the first winter, you're already seeing the gray mantle feathers coming in. And you can already see that they're lighter than the Western gulls mantle feathers. Okay, so that's again a really helpful clue. But you've got this overall shape, this kind of stretched out kind of teardrop silhouette that the bird has. And the beak in the California gull fairly quickly gets this kind of two-toned look where it's almost like it's been dipped in ink. Okay, so it's got a very black tip of the beak and then the base of the beak is much lighter without a lot of black in it. So again, when you see that, you should be thinking California gull. The Western gull, as it goes through this same stage, gets a similar kind of two-toned beak, but um, not as dramatically as the California gull does. The, the black tends to be kind of messier and more spread out in the, the immature Western gulls. Okay, let's keep going. So here we are a little bit older, um, second summer it's saying here. So again, this is almost looking like an adult California gull. It just has a few of those older, uh, you know, immature brownish covert feathers. Uh, doesn't really have any skirt to speak of. This is the edge of the greater coverts here and it doesn't have secondaries sticking out below there. Uh, it's got the nice long primaries without the white spots because again, it's not a full adult yet. So it doesn't have those white spots yet. Here's another second winter bird. And you know, this looks like a dramatically different bird. If we go back and look at this one and we compare it to this one, this is your individual variation. You know, this is a second winter California gull can look like either of these or anything in between. So in this one, the, the flight feathers are relatively old and they've, they've become real brownish. They're not really even black anymore. That's part of the bleaching that happens as the feathers age. Uh, but it has some of those, those mantle feathers coming in that give you a good hint about what, what colors they are. Um, again, you've got that dipped in ink beak that's kind of parallel sided and long without the big gonidial swelling. Relatively white head and breast is a characteristic of the California gull. And then the, the legs are sort of pinkish, but they've almost got a, like a bluish cast to them. Um, you can see it more, I guess, on this leg here, but that's a characteristic of of California gulls, the upper legs having that sort of bluish look. Your Western gull immatures won't have that. <clears throat> and we'll skip the video. So here is an adult non-breeding California gull. And there's that smudging I was talking about 
on the back of the head and the back of the neck that's heaviest right here at the base of the neck. Um, relatively big white spots in the tips of the primaries, greenish legs, California gull beak with that black ring with a red conidial spot behind it. And here's your breeding adult California gull. So again, pretty similar, but it kind of loses the, the shading on the head and neck. It actually loses a lot of the black ring, which could also be individual variation. It's still got a little bit of that black ring there on the beak. Okay. Uh, on we go. To this species, I just think they look cool when they're walking like this. And they like to walk a lot. They're a gull that likes to walk around. Um, this is a ring-billed gull. Uh, this is smaller still. So the, the Western was the biggest one we have around here. California gull is noticeably smaller if they're standing next to a Western gull. Ring-billed gull is smaller still. So now we're getting down to a pretty small gull. Um, it has even proportionally even longer and more tapered, with long primary extension. And in fact, as we'll see when we look at the range map, they are even more long distance migrants. They cover pretty much all of North America. Uh, the flecking, this is that sort of pencil type flecking. It's not as smudgy as the California gulls, dark flecking. And the mantle color is, is especially light. This is the lightest mantle of a, a gull that we commonly see around here. So even more so than the California gull. Um, legs are yellowish, There's some individual variation. And then the beak has, it's, it's even smaller than the California gull's beak. So it's, it's relatively short, relatively thin compared to the California gull with a complete black band and no red spot at all. all right, so the, I don't think the ring-billed gull is ever gonna have any red on its beak. So if you see any red on the beak, you're not looking at a ring-billed gull. And if it looks similar to a ring-billed gull, but it's got red there, you're probably looking at a California gull around here at least. Okay. And let's, again, I keep saying I'm gonna go faster and then I take too long. So here is its range map. Um, and you see they cover the whole country and then they, they retreat in the winter to the coastline. So that's where, you know, we saw that green histogram where they were kind of hard to find uh, until the fall. And then we get them much more frequently in the fall and in the winter months because they come and hang out on the coast. And we'll go look at them. Oops. So here's the juvenile. Um, lighter overall than the California gull juvenile. Again, that very long tapered uh, shape, long primary extension. Uh, the beak, somewhat smaller than a California gull's beak. And again, overall size is, is smaller than a California gull. Here it is in its first winter, it's already starting to get its, its light mantle shade in there. And this kind of, you know, again, it's sort of characteristic beak shape that it has. Not quite as long and parallel sided as the, as the California gull's beak. It does have a dark eye at this point though. So again, you're not gonna see it get that really light eye that it had in the adult until it's older. Um, second winter, starting to get very close to its adult look. Right, just it's still missing the white spots, but otherwise this is pretty close to an adult kind of bird. It's got flecking, looks kind of smudgy, looks kind of heavy at the base of the neck. So I was telling you that was a California gull thing. Well, not always. The spring-billed gull has the same kind of thing going on. But that very light mantle is, is distinctive. And here's a, a non-breeding adult. So now it's got that, that white eye, that very light iris and that, that sort of classic ring-billed beak. It's just, you know, dark black ring with no red spot. And here's a, a breeding adult. So it loses that, that flecking, right? It no longer has that. Now it's just got a clean white head. Um, there you go, and yellow bare parts.
All right, we have one more species. And you get a break. <laughs> this one looks completely different. This is the Hearman skull, a bird that until about two weeks ago, I always misspelled its name. I didn't know it had two N's. And uh, Mark Holmgren, local uh, eBird reviewer, helpfully and very diplomatically pointed out to me that uh, I was misspelling the name of this bird in my discussions of the birds I'd seen. Anyway, H-E-E-R. I used to think, I think I actually went through three spellings. I used to call it the Herman skull. And then I realized it had two E's but I didn't notice it also had two N's. So I don't know, Kierman was really into double letters. But if we get rid of all these eponymous bird names, then I won't have to remember that. We'll call it something, you know, more suitable like an ashy gull or I don't know. Uh, but it's very distinctive looking. Uh, this bright red beak in the adult is, it's the only bird, it's the only gull we have around here that looks like that. Uh, the black legs and feet, again, the only uh, adult gull you're gonna see around here with that. And this dark gray body, you know, which again, in an adult, you're not seeing that in any of these other birds. And uh, they have a pretty interesting uh, range. They actually uh, breed in Mexico. So they breed on islands and along the coast of Baja and in the Sea of Cortez and then south along the west coast of Mexico. And then in the winter, they migrate north. <laughs> In the winter, they, they leave those breeding areas and they move up onto the Pacific coast. They expand up, up here. So we tend to not see them in their breeding time as much, which is like early in the summer, like March, April. But then uh, as the year goes on, we start seeing more and more of them. These flocks of juveniles start appearing. And we have a lot of them out there right now. And I just think they're really cool looking. <laughs> so I could look at them all day. Um, Okay, so here is the juvenile plumage. So when we see the really young ones, this is what they look like. They're all dark all over. Could be mistaken for like a, you know, very young, like a juvenile Western gull or a California gull and that they're all dark. But this one is, you know, uniformly very dark. Uh, these dark feathers with these light edges. Um, not really brownish so much as just sort of a dark slaty gray. Uh, but, you know, pay attention to their beak structure. You know, it's a pretty, pretty narrow beak. Uh, and then as they mature, it's a second winter bird. So again, they're, they're very distinctive. By this time, they're, we don't have any other gulls around here that look like this. So pretty easy to, to spot. And then on into the third winter. This is the sort of the non-breeding plumage look. Here's a full-on adult non-breeding Hearman skull and the really spectacular looking to my eye at least. I'm a sucker for ombre, any kind of you know fashion that has on uh, sort of this, this graduated kind of blending. I just think that looks awesome and so they're, they're sort of ombre they have going on here with their head and neck just blows me away. Anyway, that's your adult Hearman skull. All right, so that's it for identifying those four species. We've gone through their, their whole range of individual plumage variations. It's a lot. <laughs> so I appreciate everybody just kind of hanging with me through that. At least six of you have hung with me through that. I can't tell how many more there might be just like going, ah, no, too many gulls. Uh, but for those of you who've stayed, you've, you've self-selected to be people who like looking at pictures of gulls. So that's what we're gonna do for the rest of this time. We've got a bunch of photos of gulls. And unlike those identification photos where they're just sort of standing by themselves like a field guide illustration, these are gonna be the real deal. This is what the gulls actually look like when you go out to the beach and there's a whole bunch of them and they're all mixed together and who knows what they are. Uh, these will not have labels. <laughs> these are just gonna be sort of, we're gonna talk about what we think they are. Uh, yeah, Brody, what do you have to say about this? Western gull. Oh, yes, you're already going. And I would encourage uh, those of you who've been so good and quiet all along, you can just go ahead and unmute unless you've got like a, you know, loud machinery operating there or whatever, because I'd, I'd, I'd like to get more feedback on this as we go through and discuss this. So uh, you're talking about the bird in the, in the foreground, right, Brody? And what is it about that bird that, that says Western gull to you? The big broad beak. Yeah, yeah, that's a good thing to look at. And any other features you notice? 
Oh, well, that was the first thing that I saw, so I just assumed yeah. Western. Yeah. Yep. Dark back. What's that, Andrea? Dark back. Yeah, the, the dark mantle feathers. And, you know, shading and lighting is hard to maybe see. It's sort of in shadow, but that's a really dark mantle shade. That's a, your, your Western gull mantle shade. Uh, bright pink legs. Um, you can sort of see the olive eye. Big, thick, heavy-bodied bird. So how about the one on the, the beach behind it? Do you have any, any theories on that bird? California gull? California. Yeah, I'm hearing California gull, and I agree. I think that is indeed a California gull. So you get a good comparison there. It's got the lighter mantle, the, the shading on the back and the nape, the back of the head and the nape. California gull style beak with a dark ring and just a little bit of red there. Nice long primary extension. California gull, I agree. All right, so how about this group of gulls? What do we have here? Brody, you got your hand up again. What do you think we have? Um, a bunch of the Hearman's gulls in the back of the background, and then in the foreground, I think another Western gull. Yeah, I agree. I think you're right. Um, big, yep, big. <laughs> yep, yep, agreed. Yeah, the big heavy beak on this bird in the front. Yeah, and I don't mean to, you know, this, the Hearman's gulls, but they're, they're relatively easy. <laughs> But this uh, is one in the front. So it's a, you know, it's sort of an immature Western gull. It's got some of the mantle feathers there. It's maybe, you know, second year or so, somewhere about you know, midway in its, its maturation process with that big heavy beak with the big denidial swelling and yeah, pink legs, very pink legs, Western gull. All righty. I'm gonna throw some, some juveniles at you. What do you think we've got here? Yeah, okay, Brody, keep it going. What do you think? Another one of the human skulls. So you're talking about the bird in the front? Yeah, and what is it that, that says human skull to you about this? The darker plumage. Uh, um, oh, but now I'm seeing the pink legs, which is sort yeah. of throwing me off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'm a big fan of the Sherlock Holmes stories, Arthur Conan Doyle. And I love this part where Holmes will say to Watson or Lestrade or whoever it is who's made some quick judgment about a case. He's like, no, 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 no. Don't form your theory until you've gathered all the relevant facts. So yeah, um, it's a dark gull, but these immature, these uh, juvenile, excuse me, these juvenile gulls tend to be very dark. So uh, they all, they, that's the time they look most similar, right? When they first come out, because they've all got the same imperative, you know, they're ground nesting birds in these open colonies and they're trying to, you know, be, I mean, they're not trying, but they need to be concealed from predators or they're going to be gobbled up. So they all tend to be very camouflaged, very dark. They blend in with like dark rocks or dark ground. Or, um, so yeah, so uh, the pink legs, right? If this was a Hearman's gulls, those legs would be very black. They'd be dark. So that's a, that's a big sign. And the beak, really, if you check out that beak structure, that's a pretty heavy beak, right? Yeah. Um, so do you want to you want to revise and extend your remarks? You want to go for a different guess at this point? Yes, it's probably a, a Western gull. And the one in the back, I'm sort of thinking, is a California gull. Uh, I think both of those are correct. Yeah, that's what I think, too. The one in the back, you know, it's it's got that that dipped in ink kind of beak thing going on and the right shape for a California gull beak. This kind of pattern, uh, so I haven't talked about this group, but this is, these are called the scapulars here, the sort of like shoulder area, like at the, above the base of the wing. The California gull, as it starts, you know, getting into its first winter plumage, it gets these scapulars that look like this. They have this thing that's called an anchor pattern, or it's, it's referred to as an anchor pattern. I'm not sure exactly where the anchor is in there. But these dark feathers with this sort of like whale's tail light edging at the tip, that's a, a California gull look that they have. Okay, well, let's, and then this up here, I'm guessing adult California gull, maybe, but we can't really see enough of it, so let's not worry. Let's go on to more. Look at its legs. What's that? Its legs. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of got California gull leg color, and the mantle's pretty light, you know, so. It's a good guess anyway. Ah, so these were really tricky. So um, I haven't really talked about gulls in flight because it's kind of this whole other frontier of knowledge that I'm just kind of working on myself. But um, th there's other characteristics you look for in, in gulls in flight. 
Uh, in this case, I'm, you know, Brody, you have a guess? I'm guessing the one in the very front that's closest to us, that's in almost the very front, um, okay. is a California goal. Yes, that one. I agree with you. And in fact, I eventually decided that all of these were probably California gulls. They're just in different stages. Like here's a, you know, a juvenile, a couple, another juvenile. Uh, all of these have, I mean, you know, we could spend, <laughs> we could spend the rest of the, the, the meeting just on this one photo, you know, kind of characteristics that they have as you look at different parts of them. But my sense is that all of these are, are California gulls. So that was a good, good call, but you're, you're very advanced in your gull identification skills. I'm impressed. All right, uh, what do we think we have here? Take your time. All right, Brody. Uh, Western gull in front, I think. You think this guy's a Western gull? Yeah. All right, so I call your attention to, you know, it's, you know, it's hard to tell with the lighting. So this- Look at it. Length. This beak thing is, is sort of characteristic of a different species. The dark ring with the red gonadial spot. You know, and the... Yeah, I think it might be a California gull. Yeah, I think this yeah. is in fact California gull. And yeah. you know, it's, it's tricky, but um, so you've got the Hearman's gulls next to it for, for size comparison. And you know, I think a Western gull would look even bigger in comparison with a Hearman's gull. Um, I think, you know, and you can see a little bit of kind of a greenish leg there, not so much the bright pink leg. Uh, and again, the smudging on the back of the head being heaviest in the neck, that's kind of a California gull look. I do. I think it's California gull. But that was good. I, I appreciate the, the ongoing effort. And gulls are hard. <laughs> it's kind of their defining characteristic. It's a gull that's very tricky. The guy on the okay. left, was that a California gull too? Uh, on the previous photo, I'm thinking this is a yeah. I'm thinking this is probably a, a, an Im a juvenile California gull, immature California gull, and I think that's probably what these are as well over here on the right. I think we basically got Hearmans in California in this photo. You know, but on some of these where you're only seeing a little piece of the bird, it's kind of like well, Hard to could see. be that. <laughs> if if it suddenly stood up and turned around, it might go oh no 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 it's something else. All right, this is a fun one, or at least for me, this is fun. Uh, and I'll give you a, a hint in that I believe these are two different species. Ringbill. Ringbill yeah. in California. I concur, yes, this is my, my belief as well. So we've got a ring build on the lower right and California upper left, noting the, the light iris of the ring build um, and that, that ring build beak with the black ring with no red, and then the California beak with a little bit of red and black. Can't really see the mantle shade on the, the ring build very well, but it's, it looks like maybe it's lighter than the California, and it should be a little bit lighter. Can't really see the body shape too well because of the way they're, the, at least for the ring build, it's kind of facing us. But it does seem like it's maybe a slightly smaller bird. Hard to get a good sense of the, the beak shape since they're not really in profile. The guy in the back has almost white legs. Yeah, yeah, that's tricky. I'm, I think that, I, I don't know, ring build or California, it's one or the other, I'm not sure which. Pretty big though, so it's probably a California. Yeah, if we wait long enough, maybe it'll raise its head and then we can tell. <laughs> <laughs> now we're gonna go on. All right, I, I threw a curveball here. I've got a completely different species in here. I've thrown in a completely different non-gull a, a type of turn in the back, I think. And then, yep. um, and then in the front, I think it might be the, the California. I would agree, yeah. We've got a juvenile California at the bottom here. And then two adult Californias here. They've got the bluish legs, you can see really well here. Um, that sort of California shaped beak and the black with a little bit of red and then the head and neck shading, good non-breeding plumage, adult California gullock. And these are uh, royal terns back here. Not that we're talking about terns today. And I think this is probably a, an incoming Hearman's gull to join the other Hearman's gulls here. All right, we'll keep going. 
<laughs> this is also, I don't know why I like these so much. I thought this photo was really fun. Okay, Brody, what do you think we have? Three ring build goals. I agree. I think it's three ring build goals. But I love the fact that they all have a different oh. leg color and beak color, right? Or, you know, it's like, and the, the beak color and the leg color seems to, to correspond, right? Their bare parts are sort of the same. Their skin is the same color, whatever it is. Like this one's really yellow. This one's really kind of bluish gray. And this one's sort of in between. Yeah, different health state, different breeding state, different hormone levels, you yeah. know. But yeah, but they're all ring build goals. So a good example of sort of the individual, the range of individual variation that you can see. All right, some gulls at sea. They're seagulls. <laughs> right, Brody, what are they? All Hearman schools. Yeah, all Hearman schools. Excellent. Okay. It is a little more challenging. And Western. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I think that's Laurel I heard. Yeah. So Hearman's in the foreground and Western in the background. And those Westerns, at least, are all adults. It's interesting. There's like no, no baby Westerns in there, all grown up Westerns. It is true when you see these, these big flocks, um, the most numerous tend to be the adults, which is handy, you know, because again, they live a long time, live 20 or 30 years. And then the next most numerous tends to be the first year gulls, the juvenile gulls or the very young gulls, because they have a high rate of attrition. You know, it's hard to be a gull. They have a high mortality rate in their first year. They have to learn to be a gull and learn not to become, you know, peregrine falcon food or whatever it is that gulls become when they don't become adult gulls. Um, and then, you know, fewer still of the, the second and third year birds, because again, of that, that attrition happening. But then once they make it to adulthood, they have a good long run, usually of 20 or 30 years, and you see a bunch of those. Okay. How about this interesting looking gull? Brody, what is it? California, I think. I agree. I think this is a California gull. Not quite a full adult, you know, it's still got some of the, the immature uh, coverts there, but it's got a lot of the adult mantle feathers. Um, it's got that dipped in ink kind of bill. So again, in the full adult, the tip will turn yellow and it'll just have like a black ring with a little bit of red there. But that's a good, I mean, it's a bad photo. It's not a very you know sharp photo, but you can kind of see that California gull shape to the, the beak. All right. Uh, this one. I'm trying to trying to trick you now. I'm throwing in the more you know tricky looking ones. Western. So Laurel, what is it that leads you to think this is a Western gull? The bill, the pink legs, and the um, back feathers. Yeah, yeah, the dark, relatively dark mantle. Yeah. And that's the skirt. <laughs> and the skirt, yeah, thank you. So Suzanne, yeah, so if you look here, big, big secondary skirt sticking out below the, the greater coverts there. So yeah, Western gull. I was not able to fool you. I was trying to fool you with this kind of, you know, sort of looks a little bit of a California -y look, you know, with the dark and then the red, but, but no, the Western gull. You and fooled me. What's that? You fooled me. That was the thing that threw me off. <laughs> All right. I got one of you. And its beak is not like, it's not really, I mean, it's a pretty thick beak, but it doesn't seem to have like a big swelling the way I'd like a Western gull to have, you know, it's, it's almost more like a California beak. If it was a little thinner, it would look nice and California E. Yeah, no, it's tricky. That's why you look at more than one thing. You know, it's like, again, you've got, if you've got six facts and one or two of them say this thing and three or four of them say this other thing, probably this other thing. All right. How about this one? Okay, Brody, I see you're ready. I'm going for a Western goal. Okay, and what, what leads you to say Western? The little um, swelling on the bottom uh, and the feet are a little pinkish. 
Okay. Um, I confess I have a different opinion on this bird. I think it's actually a California. Um, and what leads me to think that, now overall shape, this does look more Western-y to me. It looks very compact front to back, right? And I'm not sure if that's just how and this bird- And then it's primary wing extensions too. Yeah, this primary extension does not seem quite long enough. So I'm not sure what's going on with that. But arguing the other way, arguing for California is this sort of bluish upper leg, which I don't think I've ever seen in a, in a obviously Western gull. Um, this beak actually is pretty much a California beak. It's got a little bit of swelling, but Californias can have that much swelling. Right? And this, this very pale pinkish base of the beak and then this relatively clean black tip is kind of that dipped in ink look of a California gull. And then the mantle feathers coming in. This is a big one. Like this is sort of an adult, an adult mantle feather it's getting. And that looks too light for a Western gull to me. In fact, there's you know a bunch of them kind of coming in here. It's hard to say because they're all kind of faded and it's, you know, but at least I, I called this a California when I entered the eBird list, but you know, who knows what it actually is, but I would say California. Um, but yeah, but- uh, Yeah, you've been studying longer than me, I'm just- <laughs> Yeah, I've had I've had more opportunities than you have, but if you keep going at the rate you're at, I'll be learning from you very shortly. So keep it up, Brody, uh, and then you can you can give yeah. the, the next Dulls class maybe next year. Um, okay, how about this group? Western and the humans. Okay, I agree. How about the one in the the left that's kind of out of focus? No, the California. I'm thinking the Western because of its pink feet. It does definitely have a pink foot going on. Um, what makes me think it's a California is even though it's fuzzy, you can kind of see the, the dipped in ink look on the bill and you can see that mantle color. Like even out of focus, that really comes through and compare that color to this color, right? It's, it's dramatically lighter. And again, when you have them next to each other like this, that's when you can really take advantage of that, that comparison. Um, it's, I mean, it's farther away, so it's hard to tell if the size is due to it being farther away or if the size difference is due to it being smaller. But I usually take these with, with my zoom lens at maximum telephoto. So it does tend to uh, minimize the effect of distance. Like with a, with a telephoto shot, you know, the, the more distant bird will look more like the same size as the foreground bird. It won't be shrunk by the distance as much. And I think that kind of leads in the direction of thinking this is probably a smaller bird than this. Of course, it also looks smaller than the Hermans, which a California isn't. It's a little bigger than a Hermans. So. Um, anyway, uh, I thought that was a California. All right, here's a nice unambiguous bird. What is this bird, Brody? Ring-billed. It is a ring-billed gull. It is a nice adult ring-billed gull. Um, yeah, it's got the very light mantle, the light iris, little, you know, fine flecking on the, the head, um, and then that, that ring-billed pattern on the bill. All right. Another juvenile. Just when you think it's easy, then another juvenile comes walking by and you've got to deal with all that juvenile stuff. California. I'm sort of thinking California. Yeah. Western. I think Western. Yeah, I, I, I'm leaning Western because of the beak. I, I feel like that's a Western beak shape. Yeah. Or size, yeah, you know. Yeah. You can't tell the size. Yeah. You can't see the, the overall, you can't see the primary extension because it's not really angled the right way. But yeah, I think this is a, a juvenile, like a relatively young juvenile Western gull, like just out of the nest a few weeks ago. All right. This is a nice comparison of some adult gulls. Yeah, Brody, what are they? Western in the front and then two Californias in the back. Yeah, yeah, all the way. Good call. I see you've got you've got gulls in your background, Brody. Is that like a virtual Zoom background? Yes. Um, I. Do... Hmm. 
you you muted in the middle there. Oops. Um, I just went I just went online and then took a screenshot and I put it on a Zoom background. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure if those are are those laughing gulls or are they Franklin's gulls? Did it say? Do you know what they are? Uh, I didn't check. Okay. Well, well, we'll leave them for next time. Those are not those are not in the big four. We've got enough to keep track of with the big four. And I want to get through the rest of these, so we'll we'll go quick. Okay. Here's another kind of mean photo because I, I don't let you see really anything about the, the shape of its body. California. Yeah, that's California doll. That, you know, legs aren't really pink enough for a Western, mantle's not dark enough for a Western. That red spot means it's not gonna be a ring build. You're kind of left with California. Okay, this one's a little tr trickier. Well, yeah, Brody, what are, what are we looking at here? The one that you can barely see in the back is uh, California, the one closer, the, the one in the very back. On which um, side, left or right? Uh, left. So this Wait, one no, here with right, the twinkle? Right, up? right, no, Over the here? One, yes, that one I think is a California or okay. a ring build. Okay. The one um, a little closer I think is um, the one on the left this one is a uh, california and then the one in the very front is a western all right well i agree with most of that um yeah this one i feel like western it's got the dark mantle it's got the super heavy beak that's that's looking real good for western this one in back here uh i think because you can kind of see its light eye that makes it easy to say, even though you can't see that much of the bird, that this is a, a ring build, right? And then this one, I would think is, this one maybe California. Yeah, I could, I could see that. It's hard to tell. We can't really see too much of it, but the, the, the mantle shade looks pretty good for California. Um, this one I think is likely a ring build. And the things that, that lead me to say ring build on this are the, the relatively light mantle, like it's just a little too light for California. Um, this beak is, is really more of a ring build shape. And in the immature ring build, especially it's, it's relatively short. It's got this kind of, I don't know, it's almost like banana shaped or something. I'm not sure how to describe it, but I, I've looked at a lot of these ring build photos. And it's like, oh yeah, it's got that, that sort of kind of short little pointy beak. Um, California's beak tends to be longer and more kind of parallel sided. Uh, it does sort of have that dipped in ink look, though, which the ring build shares with the California. And then uh, the flecking, you know, is is more like little discrete flecks, not as smudgy and not heavier down here on the neck. So that kind of feels uh, ring build to me, not so California. And um, we didn't spend a lot of time looking at it, but the the wing pattern with these these lighter, greater coverts. Um, is more of a ring build kind of look. Ring builds have these really interesting patterned wings in their like first winter birds. If you study the field guides, you can kind of see when they're in flight, it's really pretty dramatic looking and, and a good clue. And I think maybe that's what we're seeing with the folded wing here. But I'm not positive about that part. But anyway, I thought that was a ring yeah. build. <laughs> okay, uh, boy, we've gone, as usual, we've gone very long. Once I get excited, we just keep on going. Uh, we're almost, almost through the end here. I just wanted to whip through the last few things. Um, West in the back and then the ring build in the front. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is, um, and this was taken, I just took this like a week or so ago. This is, there's been like this one ring build hanging out on the beach down at the end of, uh, down at the south end of Carpinteria Creek, kind of in the campground there on the beach. There's a gull flock that likes to hang out there. So I've been, I was getting ready for this class. So I've been visiting that gull flock a lot and studying those gulls. All right. who has a, a theory on these birds. Okay, Brody, keep it going. What have we got? California in the front and then the, the humans um, a little farther back. Yep, I agree. I think that's exactly what we have there. I can't really see because my, my screen controls are kind of covering this bird. It's got a band on it. That's interesting. It's a little silver band on its right leg. 
Um, I can't see more of that bird, so I'm not sure what it is. Maybe another California, not sure. Um, okay, but yeah, in terms of the ones you can actually see, nice adult Hermans. I'm not sure how old this one is. It's hiding its head. Um, and here, this is a you know good-looking California immature, immature California bell. Oh, so this one I threw in here not because it's so hard to identify, because I just thought it was interesting. This is a bird that was down there at, at the mouth of Carpinteria Creek a few days ago. Um, so I think these are this is the same individual bird, this one and this one. These are just two shots of it, but it had this like yellow stain on the back of its head that I'd never seen before. And I almost wonder if it was something that some researcher did, because I know that sometimes bird researchers, besides banding birds, will also put colored stains on the back of the head specifically as a way to kind of keep track of individuals as they're doing stuff. So I don't know, maybe there was some sort of you know, hmm. research or maybe, you know, I mean, gulls are also always poking their heads into sort of places they shouldn't be poking their heads to get, you know, maybe it was just a Cheetos bag that it was digging around in and it happened to get that on the back of its head from doing that. But I thought it was interesting. All right. So this is another species pair. I'll give you that hint that these are two different species. Okay, Brody, what do you think? Ring build, which is doing something weird with its wings and then the California, which is just pretty much sitting there almost about to take a step. I would agree, yeah, yeah. And there's a good, so this is a good example of those beak shapes I was talking about. To me, this is, California shapes, kind of longer and parallel sided. And this is more of that ring build shape I was talking about, that kind of, I don't, again, I don't know what to call it, banana shape. Is this kind of a little shorter and a little more ovoid? I don't know, not as parallel sided as the, the California bell. And yeah, it's, it's preening. You know, you see them, you know, contorting into all kinds of weird positions as they're taking care of their feathers. They spend a lot of time taking care of their feathers. And I'm seeing these gulls usually because they're coming to Carpinteria Creek to, to bathe and get every feather in place and they'll just sit there and put themselves in all kinds of weird positions. All right, we really do just have a few. I keep saying that, but there's just a few left. Here's a, a poor quality photo of a couple of cool looking birds. What, do you, what are they, Brody? I think um, that the one in the front is a Western, the one in the back could possibly be the a California because of its beak, but I'm still looking at its feet thinking that it's a Western. Yeah, I would agree. And the, um, and also, you know, don't forget to check out the mantle shade. Like this is really too, that gray is too dark on those incoming feathers to be a, a California gull. They would be lighter shade if they were a California. I think this is another, another Western gull. So yeah, two Western gulls. Okay, how about these two? Okay, Brody? Both ring builds. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm actually leaning California on these, but I'm not really sure. This seems a little dark to me for a ring build. Yeah, and I see the little red spot. And there's a little them. red. And that to me says, okay, that, that's the giveaway that to me says this one is a California. And if this one's a Cali yeah then, yeah, then this one would need to be noticeably smaller to be a ring build and it's not, it's about the same size. So I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to think these are both California, although this one's gray, looks a little lighter, you know, so it's, that's why I don't put any labels on these because I don't actually know. Yeah, the one in the back, I was going to say the, um, I was going to say the same thing about it. Yeah. I'd want to see more, more of it. I want to watch it for a while and study it, right? Like Sibley says, don't be hasty. Take your time. Okay. How about, how about this one? There's a definite young juvenile. Still has the, the pale edges on his juvenile feathers. Very dark head, I would point out. Kind of this dark pinkish legs. Hard to get a good sense of the shape, really, because it's you know, the tail is here. Like, how long is that relative to the wings? Hard to say. But the beak, the beak is definitely trying to tell us something. So, Western. Yeah, yeah. I think this is a juvenile Western gull, just straight from Anacapa Island, moving out in the world. This 
This is a shot I took this morning. This is out in Carpinteria Creek. With the early sun on it. Yes, Brody, what is this bird? Western gull. Yeah, that beak is too big for anything else in this group of four, at least. I mean, there's some other big gulls that have big beaks, but uh, very unlikely to show up around here. Yeah, it's a Western gull. And this bird, so this one I actually, okay, just, you know, to full confession, when I put in my eBird list this morning, I had this one in there as gull species because I didn't want to commit myself. I was like, you know, I mean, the one in the back, you know, is, is a Western gull, an adult Western gull, kind of light looking mantle, but, but still I think Western gull in the back. But this one in the front, you know, I really wrestled with. Um, the beak says California to me, right? And the, the sort of size relative to the, the Western gull but the this dark whole, eye. yeah, the dark eye, although, you know, even a ring build of this age would have a dark eye as well. But yeah, that, you know, that, that sort of rounded head, I didn't talk about it, but that sort of rounded head profile is sort of a California thing as well. Um, I didn't really like the pattern so much. It didn't seem quite what I was used to in terms of California go. And the beak, you know, the sort of dirty blackish pink, you know, didn't seem like the dipped in ink look I was looking for. So I put it in as gull species, came home and, and consulted my, my gulls of the Americas and, and went to the page for California gull. And I came to the conclusion that what this bird is showing me is that I'm not that familiar with this particular age of a juvenile California gull. Like I'm used to seeing them when they're very fresh out of the nest and they're very dark all over. The beak is all dark, you know, I, I sort of, and the, the bird itself is relatively dark. And I'm used to seeing them the way they look basically by October, by the end of October or so, when they start getting some of those, uh, those fresh mantle feathers coming in. They're not, they're, they're like the, what is it? The post juvenile molt that they have. There's names for all these molts. Anyway, they start getting that anchor pattern on the, the scapulars, these feathers through here. And this one didn't have that, it's, but it, I think it's gonna get that. It's gonna get it just in another month or so. And the, the beak not having that dipped in ink look again in another month or so, I think it will have that. This is more like a sort of transitional stage that I just wasn't that familiar with. Um, but again, I think it's a California gull. But I could be wrong. You know, I wasn't sure when I, when I looked at it this morning at the beach and still could be corrected. I could get one of those emails from the eBird reviewers saying, I'm wrong about your gull. But, uh, but that's it. Those are all the gull photos. We made it all the way to the end. Yay. Um, so thank you all very much. Uh, any other feedback, commentary? Thank you, John. This was incredibly helpful. Yeah. yeah it was very, very good. Yeah. Well, and Excellent. I, I encourage you to, I mean, if you thought this was fun, <laughs> go out to the beach. <laughs> you know, if you get out there <laughs> before people really start, you know, jogging a lot and before there's a lot of dogs out, you know, the gulls are just hanging out. And they'll just stand there, you know, a hundred of them down at the end of, of Carpinteria Creek, and they'll just let you study them as long as you like. Or you can take photos, you know, you can go out there even with a not great camera, like mine's not a great camera. You know, I, I can get like, you know, 15, 20 feet away from a gull. I mean, I can get a good photo that I can, I can look at as long as I want to. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you guys all very much. Uh, any other feedback or commentary before we go? Thank you, Joanne, no. or Joy, I guess, for the, the, the hearts. I like that. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, in two weeks, we will go on and do uh, the, the slightly more exotic five. So we'll have five more gull species that we can also get around here. But, you know, if you study those four, it's, it's a really great, solid foundation to work from. Because then if you find one that doesn't fit into any of those categories, you can really focus in on it and say, okay, well, what do I have here? And that's a lot less work than trying to do that much work for every single one. Yeah, Brody, did you have your hand up to? to I'm say gonna, something? I'm gonna go to the beach tomorrow. We were Excellent. already going to, but then once I heard that it was gonna be the, the goals today, I was pretty happy because we were gonna go and. Anyway. <laughs> go go check out those flocks, and and this yeah. is the time of year when you could get something strange in there. You know, you hmm. could start to get some, some weird vagrant. You know gull that doesn't normally hang out here that just went in the wrong direction and ended up on our beach. So, you know, definitely look for those ones that look different. 
Okay, everybody. Well, thank you again. Uh, okay. And uh, I will see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody. Yeah. Thank you.